Hi, hello everybody. Um, thank you so much for having us. Um, it's an honor to be here to share our work with this community. We are Francesca and Anna, and we are time-based media conservators at, at Tate. In our presentation today, we would like to guide you through our process of preparing what we call exhibition format files for display of artworks that have digital audiovisual files as their main components. We'll be focusing on decision making around encoding media for specific displays and choices around equipment and tools. At the same time, we want to share our experiences in the context of our museum collection, reflect on the way we are documenting the decision making process and the tools we use and hopefully get some good ideas from you. Um, just to give you a bit of uh, background, Tate has around 750 time-based media artworks uh, in the collection. And this includes video, software, performance, film, sound, and slide-based artworks. These artworks spend most of their life sitting on a shelf, um, separated into different components such as media, equipment, sculptural elements, documentation, and etc. All these components are waiting for the moment they will be reunited again and installed in a gallery to exist as an artwork. The conservation process starts really with the acquisition of the artwork, but it might take several years before this artwork gets displayed and sometimes it's difficult to predict the exact context of a future display. Often this determines the choice of equipment either to overcome obsolescence, fit a specific gallery setting, or simply because of limitations or improvements in technology. Um, the consequence is that uh, often we will need to produce a new exhibition format file from our master. In our next slides, Francesca, we'll talk you through an example from the collection where we had to create new exhibition formats for a specific display context. So, um, in the early 2000s, the artist Pierre Wig and Philippe Parano started a project called No Ghost, Just a Shell. Um, they bought the rights to a cheap manga character that was sort of designed to be an anonymous story filler uh, and decided to call her Anne Lee. Uh, the action was meant to be a sort of path towards the glorification of anonymous Anne Lee, uh, and they asked for the help of many colleagues to give her an identity and dignify her through art. Um, the fact that it was most male artists asked to give poor Andy an identity is a whole different story. We don't have time for my feminist runs here. Anyways, uh, the result of this project is a great collection of artworks, and now Andy is a complex character who possibly has constant identity crisis. So Tate co-owns this group of works with MoCap North Miami, and we're specifically responsible for the time based media elements of the piece which means nine video works, um, one audio uh, piece, all by different artists using different production methods. So. Um, in 2018, uh, Tate decided to display No Ghost Just a Shell in the Transformer Galleries, former oil tanks, huge insidious concrete spaces. And this is um, an image of the entrance of the Transformers. For the ones among you who've never been there, the tanks are a conservator's nightmare. They require the most creative approach to figure out how to display anything. The structure is untouchable, they're dusty, humid spaces, they cannot be altered permanently. Um, the opposite of a white cube, which is quite exciting in a way too. Um, when a time-based media artwork from the collection gets requested for display, these are some guidelines on how we like to proceed in order to make sure we have enough information to start producing media for the display. So the first step is to observe the artwork and its history and look for clues. So in this case, the, first, the files revealed a general production quality with a DIY feel, which was common in the early days of digital animation and had a typical early 2000 aesthetics. Some of the artists supply masters wear DVDs. Um, most of the display packs are very, very loose. And when in 2016, some of the works part of No Ghost Just a Shell were requested for loan, I had the chance to make exhibition format files with my colleague Ali Ash. Um, 
the research was very useful to evaluate how to intervene on the files. So Ali produced a lot of documentation that informed many choices we made subsequently in 2018 for the tanks display. Uh, and with a bit of quick Googling, I realized that many of those video works have been shown in the most desperate configuration and on many different supports. So the second step and tip is to analyze the files, their relationship with the equipment. So what are the masters? Are there any previous exhibition format files? Uh, on what carrier and why? Is the historical equipment uh, an integral part of the artwork? Uh, here are some of the tools we use to inspect video and audio files like Media Info, VLC, Audacity, QC tools. Um, this is the moment uh, to gather objective information on the files uh, to determine what's the best type of equipment and what are the limitations. So the files made for the loan in 2016 were produced to be played via bright sun players. Um, because we didn't have any masters with more information, we decided to start working from those files. And then the last tip is to listen, watch, compare, and ask for help, reach out. Uh, in this case, the artists are still alive. They were both involved in both displays in 2016 and 2018 in the tanks. Um, they provided feedback and information on their own works. So we had to reach out to Black Magic to ask details on some of the equipment we wanted to use, ask around for tips with using some FFMPAG commands, call RTV, which is a um, company, to ask tips on the produ production of audio. They're always super helpful. Um, and we always help each other as colleagues because we come from very different backgrounds, different skills. That's, um, so yeah, it's, it's great. And now we're reaching out to you, to this community too. Um, so, the gallery layout. Uh, after gathering all this big solid base of knowledge about the artwork and its media, it was then time to figure out how to display the video works in the Transformer galleries. So the curator was keen on showing three of the Nogos videos in one space. All three happened to have 5.1 soundtracks. So my colleague Jack McConkey, who you met last year, he did a really good presentation on VR. Uh, pitched the idea of showing them sequentially, clockwise, uh, one after the other with a 7.1 layout. So the feel of having three works in the space would always be there uh, because of the presence of the screen. So they had kind of like a sculptural also presence in the space. But the viewer could move in the space according to what video was shown and with a spatial awareness that determined also by sound and the, by the sound moving around in the space. So pretty nice. Um, on the left, you can see the floor plan of the room in the, uh, in the Transformers. Uh, uh, no, sorry. On the right, that's like my very professional drawing um, with the name of the artist. So A, B, C, it's uh, to identify the screens and then the numbers are the audio channels. So to kind of explain it a little bit, while um, video A was playing, your 5.1 configuration will be 1, 3, 5, 7, and 8 sub. And then C will be like 3, 5, 1, 7, and then the sub. And then same for like B, or the other way around. So this slide shows uh, what uh, different elements are combined for a display. So on the left corner, you have all the documentation about the artworks. And then we've got all of our media, uh, and then some of the equipment used, because I couldn't fit everything, but it's just to sort of give you an idea that the equipment is very much involved. Um, so for, um, for this specific display, we decided to test the use of Hyperdeck Studio Mini, uh, which now looking back, I will do it in a very different way, but. Uh, because we will, have, we will have minimized the amount of equipment to maintain on display, and it's a very important thing, and especially on the audio front. Uh, plus, we were looking for the right platform to test them, because when you have a new toy, you kind of want to play with it, as a playback device and test their reliability. So the plan we made was to use three HyperDex synchronized via a custom HyperSync box manufactured by this company called RTV and create three video tracks of the same length and add the audio only on one of the videos. 
So then de-embed the sound and feed it through our Genelec active speakers through the mini DSP, which allowed us to assign each audio channel to the right correspondent speaker and equalize the sound for this specific space, which is quite crucial. It's a crucial re uh, requirement for a space like the tanks to be able to equalize. Um, after selecting all the equipment based on what theoretically seemed to be a perfect solution, uh, we stumbled on some issues. So the three video files don't have the same frame rate. So two of them are PAL, one of them is NTSC, but we needed to combine them in one timeline and assure correct playback. So we made several tests, and the best solution to handshake with our equipment was to output a 50p. We did a lot of video, visual checks, and it looked fine, so that kind of passed. So another discovery from our test was there is no way to get the R product to play a 4.3 video. And this was not explicit from the tech specs of the equipment, so shout out to Blackmagic. Um, it was a nightmare discovery, but at that point it was too late to change everything, um, all of our layouts and choices. So I decided to test stretching the content to 69 in post, making it into a ProRes, and squeeze it back to 4.3 by using the feature on the projector. It worked wonders, although I was, um, it was a very rough butchering uh, process, and I felt really guilty about it. In this case, I, just, I justified my approach as legitimated by the nature of the old No Ghost project, uh, and I felt sort of a creative freedom with the duty of making it look good. So the other thing uh, that is going to make you cringe is that the master source was uh, 4.3 MPEG and MP4 files, and we needed to create ProRes 69 to, uh, for compatibility issues with our HyperDex. Um, the selected projectors and media were 4.3. And in order to output eight channels of audio via SDI on HyperDex, we had to create a 60-channel multitrack, and that um, I actually discovered after trying many times different things. So um, here uh, we're showing you some of the tools used to work on the files. So to demux the use subler, uh, and then the amazing FFmpeg commands to split the 5.1 soundtracks to uh, single label channels. Um, it was an incredible discovery and saved a lot of a lot of time. And here uh, it's the premier project to make um, one of the final ProRes 42 50p 1280 720 resolution. Um, and you can see the horrible 69 stretch. And this is a partial view of the final installation. Um, despite all the behind the scenes that's just been revealed to you, it all looked good. And the artists were happy, the curator was happy. We we're also happy because it runs smoothly for roughly six months, requiring almost zero maintenance. So I'll pass it back right to Anna. Um, so as uh, Francesca has just shown you with No Ghost Just a Shell, often creating an exhibition format file from a master is not a linear process and it can be quite messy. Uh, this involves a lot of trial and error, many detours and a thorough <laughs> testing process. Um, in the daily reality of a big, busy museum like Tate's, we need to make sure files and equipment deliver the desired playback in a specific display context, and it all needs to be pretty trouble-free. Given this, we would like to start capturing these detours in a more efficient way to help us inform our decisions in the future when installing the artwork in another context. Uh, now, how are we documenting the decision-making process around the display? Um, we brought you an excerpt of No Ghost Just a Shell's installation report to show you how we document this process at the moment. An installation report is created uh, after an artwork has been installed in the gallery. With the help of prompts, it is aimed at capturing information on a specific context such as space, equipment, decisions made, artist involvement, some details on the media, and so on. However, this template was not conceived thinking about the detours that happen when creating exhibition formats and the rationale, or lack of it, behind such processes. Uh, the preparation of exhibition media 
is most of the times captured through screenshots of GUIs, which reveal the settings that have been used. But sometimes it's difficult to accompany this with notes while in the process of creating a file. Therefore, some information is inevitably lost during uh, the process. Uh, in addition, we save media info reports of the final exhibition formats, which also provide a lot of information on the file, but not necessary on the equipment used, the display context, and the reasoning around the file production. But what about all the detours? How can we link a file prepared for a specific hardware and context back to the artwork in a more efficient way? And why, why do we want to do this? So time-based media artworks are alive within the collection as they always adapt to display contexts. This means that alongside the constant elements of an artwork, for instance, it is intended always to be projected rather than displayed on a monitor, there are flexible features that change every time uh, an artwork is displayed. The projection size, for example, could be variable um, depending on space. On top of this, technolo technological obsolescence causes inevitable changes. What is crucial for us as conservators working in a museum is to understand how all these changes happen and how we shape them. Um, tracking these changes is key to capture the history of the artwork and to inform future uh, displays. Uh, to better document the production of an exhibition format file, we believe that we should be combining technical information about the file and tools with personal notes on decisions around the media production process. This will allow us to link an exhibition file back to the artwork, its concept and authenticity. We believe that if we document the detours that happen when preparing an exhibition uh, format, this will help us understanding context and decisions that were made in a specific instance and inform future displays of a time-based media artwork. Now, Ghost Just a Shell was a perfect example to show how past treatments and interventions on files helped us shape a display in a very specific context. Here are some of the options that we are um, considering at the moment. So screenshots, as we has, uh, have explained, sometimes we use GUIs like Handbrake, and um, perhaps we should also make annotations. We're also thinking about outputting FFM logs with annotations as well to be able to uh, identify the, the exact information we need. Combining files, uh, media info reports with information about treatments and storing them in the artwork folders, which will be separate from um, uh, the file storage. And aggregating tec technical reports and storing documentation in the container of our exhibition format files but we have so many different codecs and containers in the collection. Um, this is with the hope of being able to extract data once we ingest everything in our future high value digital asset storage. We believe that these methods, individually or combined, depending on the media we are preparing, will help us link a specific uh, file back to the artwork. We would very much love to discuss these ideas with you and understand how feasible they might be. Uh, we want to thank the Time Based Media Conservation Gang for all their support and good vibes. Uh, and a thanks to this commu community, special thanks to Dave Rice, who uh, always gave us a lot of good advice. We even managed to get him hooked in the challenges of creating a media conch policy for exhibition format files that play on bright signs. Thanks to Reto Cromer, who ran a great workshop at Tate Britain not that long ago, and to Agata um, Jarczyk, who took the time to have a chat with us a few weeks ago. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Questions? Oh, God. A whole bunch. OK. Uh, <laughs> ladies first. I'm here for the feminist rants. Hi. Does this? <laughs> Hey, hi, this is a question from the live stream. Um, so the question is, is software a component of the work in addition to media elements and equipment? Or does that get in wrapped up in the equipment requirements, i.e. is there any software? Is it part of the work? 
Oh, just the, is the question, a compo is the software considered a component of the work or is it just part of the equipment requirements? But like, which software? Like anything you need to run it, no. Like it depends, we have software-based artworks and that's a whole different story. But like, no, in this case, we just, um, it's the, a component, the component of the work is the file. Yeah, uh, unless the artist specifies something. But it's always, I think we kind of proceed considering artist specification. If, is it good? Um, hello, Steve, again. Um, first question, do you store the version of the software you use? Because I use storing logs, but also good, at least for VLC, to know which version exactly you used, because uh, between version, it could have bugs fixed, for mm -hmm. example, that displays the things differently. Also, I wonder why you had to transfer to ProRes. Is it to be able to use your hardware? Because yes. maybe a lot of you don't know, but VLC is also uh, capable of uh, sending videos through SDI, which can feed hardware directly. Mm -hmm. It's not just a PC or a phone player. You can actually feed uh, real hardware, uh, professional hardware with it. Do you want to answer the first one? Uh, so in terms of the software, no, we don't, we don't save. But yes, we would like to at least save information about the version that we are, we are using when preparing these, uh, uh, these files, definitely. And I think maybe there is, like, just to kind of give a bit, there is a distinction between the process of acquisition of an artwork. So like acquiring and then when you guys do like in acquisition all the QCing. So I think maybe more information are captured in there yes. on like what softwares are used to sort of QC and to like play, test the playbacks. But with the displays, I think it's, it's always a little bit of like a rough and ready preparation because we need to put stuff on display and sometimes it's, it needs to be quick. Uh, and then the second, yeah, we had to transcode to ProRes to use the hardware. Um, and again, as I said, I will, I will probably do it in a very different way now. Uh, it's just that, yeah, we had this new toy and we kind of wanted to try the toy. And I think this specific type of artwork kind of gave us a little bit of freedom to sort of experiment with the files. But we mainly use them now uh, to sort of play back ProRes. So if a lot of our masters are ProRes, so uh, it's, it's pretty useful to use them to play for us. Um, we don't use a lot of like computers for playback in the galleries because we found them to be a bit less reliable. They crash, they, so, but it's good tip about VLC and I'll definitely go home and do a bit of extra research. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So. Hi, I'm Lode. I'm uh, involved in media art as well. I. Um, set up my own work and I set up other people's work. My first question is, do you share the documentation with other in, um, organizations? Because we have been getting work that's been presented in SMAC from Ghent in Belgium, but the documentation you have, and certainly like the ProRes files or the master files would be very handful, uh, helpful for any organization to set it up all again and not go through the whole documentation and research project. So, um yeah, at the moment we don't share, it's a bit the backstage, and I guess then in conservation it's a little bit like that. We always have our files and it's backstage. Obviously, um, you can request Tate to access some of the information, but it's, it's a very, um, how do you say, um, it takes a very long time to have a, um, an answer and um, to go through all the process, but it's, it's a very good idea and I think, yeah, we should be more in network and share our experiences to be able to tackle these uh, kind of situations in a more um, network way, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, more than happy to have a chat and talk yeah. about and, I don't know, meet and kind of go over all of this, for sure. Okay.